In the effort to address child poverty in New York, stakeholders have identified a state working families tax credit, which could put money into the pockets of parents and caregivers as a key tool, especially if state policymakers are serious about realizing the statutory goal of cutting child poverty rates in half by 2032. To discuss the shape of the working families tax credit and why it's a good investment, we're joined by the measure's assembly sponsor, Queens Democrat Andrew Hevesy. Welcome back to the show, assembly member. Thank you, Dave. Good to see you. So walk us through the ins and outs of this proposal. What is it meant to do and who does it target? Well, let me take a, a, the big picture approach. So poverty in New York State is a choice of government, frankly. And right now we have poverty rates, particularly in our major cities, that are just way too high. So if you look at the poverty rates for children in New York City, they're above 20%. Um, and then you go upstate to some of our other cities like Syracuse and, and Buffalo and others, uh, and the numbers rise to somewhere in the neighborhood of 41% to 45%. So that's children who are living in poverty. That means they're exponentially more likely to have trouble later in life and cost taxpayers more money for additional services down the road. So the smart investment, the way to deal with this now is to put the working families tax credit uh, that we have proposed with Senator Gunnardis, who's been fantastic in leading this charge, um, into the Final budget with projections that we can drop those numbers by about 13.6%, I believe it is, for those who are under the poverty level, and even up to 19.6%, uh, a drop for those who are double um, below the poverty level. This is the, uh, the, the real poor, those who are struggling to survive. So as proposed in the Senate's one-house budget, the Working Families Tax Credit would be worth $550 per child to single taxpayers making less than $75,000 and married filers under $130,000 with a lower, more progressive benefit for higher income earners. Is that broadly speaking, what's in the standalone legislation as well? That mirrors the bill. Okay. So the Senate basically put the bill in, which I'm very grateful to them for. And now the Assembly advanced, instead of this, a supplemental version of the Empire State Child Credit. Is that a meaningful alternative to the working families tax credit? Is that a, a viable path to go as opposed to the working families tax credit? Or would you like to still see the working families tax credit be part of uh, final budget negotiations? It's a great question. So the answer is I'm looking to have the working families tax credit in the final budget. Now, it's not just the um, uh, child empire child credit that you mentioned that's in the assembly one house, although that's a big piece. The other piece is the assembly puts in the money, and this is where the most important part, about $500 million um, dedicated by the assembly to tax credits. So part of it you mentioned, the Empire Child Credit. The other part of it are two changes to the earned income tax credit. Now, you remember the Working Families Tax Credit uh, proposal is a combination of those two credits. So the assembly has put in a financial plan, and put up around $500 million at the base of these negotiations. And I hope we get closer to the working families tax credit as we go on. Is there merit to the idea of working with existing credits like the Empire State Child Credit, like the Earned Income Credit, as opposed to carving out something new? Uh, there is, and there have been uh, arguments made by some of our Ways and Means team, and we appreciate the arguments. Yeah, uh, but this is again a jumping-off point for negotiations. Um, so what we're seeing is we have the Earned Income Tax Credit now, we have the Child Credit, um, and there are other credits on the books that are not achieving the goal that you need. Mm -hmm. So we're open to all ideas to get money in the pockets of the working poor and those who are struggling to survive. If the mechanism at the end of the day comes out that it's the Working Families Tax Credit, I would be thrilled. If it's not the working families tax credit, yet we are putting 500 million additional dollars in the pockets of those people through the earned income tax credit or the empire child credit, that's a good victory. We just happen to think that the working families tax credit is a better way to go. A report from the children's agenda, which makes the case for the working families tax credit, uh, outlines some of the structural deficiencies as they see it of some of the existing credits, whether it's lower income families not being eligible for the full credit under the Empire State Child Credit or the impact uh, that minimum wage workers feel uh, on the earned income credit. So when we talk about improving these programs, is the focus just on putting more money into them or is there a debate about changing? changing uh, how they're actually structured, like we've seen with other tax credits and how here in state government we're finally 
applying credits uh, for kids under the age of four. Yeah, and by the way, the zero to four was a great victory for us last year. But the answer to your question is, it's both. So we have to put up the money. There's no reason why we can't put up this money this year. The Assembly has a financial plan and has put that uh, close to $500 million in there. Uh, but we are gapped in our multiple credits, as you alluded to. So if you're looking at the Empire Child Credit, you're capped at the number of children you can have. You alluded to the fact that the lowest income people are not getting the highest benefit, which is a gap in the system itself. That needs to be changed. Uh, but also, we try to set a minimum for the credit for people. We also try to set a maximum for credit for uh, people who are eligible. So the bottom line is, in answer to your question, it's both. We need to put up the money, but we have significant gaps in our current structure that is not giving the benefit where it needs to go. Can New York achieve its goals of reducing child poverty rates by half before 2032 without the working families tax credit or uh, an increased investment in some of the other credits we've talked about that put money back into the pockets of families? I do not believe so. Um, and I want to go back and give credit where credit is due to my colleague, Senator Ramos and Assemblymember Bronson, who set the stage for this by passing these uh, very aggressive goals on how to reduce poverty. But the only way to really do them is to tax credits. You can do other things that we are working on them as well for child care and uh, other ways to get money into the pockets of, of the poor. But this is um, the primary way to do it. We are also waiting for a report from the task force. The state has a task force on this, and I'm pretty sure they'll come back with the idea of credits as well. So um, the, the answer is yes, we have to do these credits in order to get rid of the um, intolerably high rates of childhood poverty throughout the state. Yeah, I think if that task force, uh, the Child Poverty Reduction Advisory Council, if they come back with anything that doesn't uh, endorse uh, tax credits, it really calls into question the legitimacy of the council at this point. Yeah, let's say I'd be surprised if they did that. So when we've spoken with the governor's budget director, Blake Washington, about the idea of achieving uh, the poverty reduction goals that the state has, he's pointed to the need for federal investment if we're going to realize this. You you began this conversation by noting that poverty is a choice. So do we need to wait for the federal government to step in or do we have the resources right now or the capacity to tap those resources in New York to make things like the Working Families Tax Credit possible? So far, I'm of the opinion you never wait for the federal government to do anything. Considering the politics down in Washington, I'm uh, grateful for whatever they can uh, do, but um, uh, but that's not a viable strategy to wait for Washington to act, even though I'm very excited about the prospect at the federal level of uh, the Biden administration changing the child credit. Um, but no, we have the resources. There's absolutely no reason why we shouldn't be able to fund this, uh, and we just need to have the will. And I also think, and this is this speaks to the problem with budgeting in the in the state of New York, and I think perhaps everywhere in, in the United States, we are not valuing preventative government the way that we should be. Preventative government means giving people money at the beginning so they don't fall into costing us much more money on the on the back end for taxpayers, whether it's through criminal justice services or cops or EMS or any of the other services that you will have to get that are exponentially more likely for people who grow up impoverished. Both the Assembly and Senate One House proposals include higher taxes on the very wealthy in New York, as well as uh, on corporations making, I think, in excess of $5 million net profits. And the Senate proposal, I don't know what the assembly language is, is the only way to pay for things like the working families tax credit to bring in additional revenue, or, or can it be done within the existing revenue that we already anticipate? So I don't think it's the only way, but it's certainly a primary way. Um, and we, we are cognizant of the fact that the governor has taken a pretty strong stand about uh, personal income taxes um, in this year's budget. And while the assembly has proposed that, you hit it right on the head. We all to propose some uh, a corporate franchise tax increase for those who make over five million and those who make over twenty five million. Um, so we could do it within existing resources, except then you get into the game of what are you cutting to get to these tax credits. So I am of the opinion that you absolutely should keep the corporate franchise tax and any other taxes to continue us on our path to end poverty. And it's not uh, that I'm for raising taxes, and I want to be clear about that. I'm not with the left wing of the party that thinks we should tax and spend, but I have come off now, this is my second decade in Albany, um, and the last decade was austerity. 
there was a cap. And we saw the consequences and we saw what happened as a result. Uh, and the result is right now you have in Syracuse, New York, you have a, a poverty level with almost half of the children in that entire city are impoverished. It's just unnecessary and it's bad government. And that's why we need to get away from that. And that's why I am supportive of these uh, taxes. So with the time we have left, I want to pivot to the administration of the Child Victims Act, a 2019 law that created a window for New Yorkers who were the victims of sexual abuse when they were minors uh, to bring lawsuits that otherwise would have been moot because of timeliness concerns. Uh, we've seen a lot of cases brought against large institutions, both private, nonprofit, and under government. And there seems to be some concern uh, about the ability of some of these institutions institutions uh, to pay out, uh, potentially not having either the insurance coverage or having lapsed their coverage or the insurance not covering it. Given that backdrop, does the state need to step up and shore up some of these uh, institutions, which could be heading towards financial destitution, depending on how uh, these cases play out in the court system? Yeah, the answer is yes. So I was a sponsor of the Child Victims Act. Credit to all of us for opening up that window. But when now we have to deal with the consequences, which include the payouts. When you're talking about certain institutions that are responsible for the payouts, they have deeper pockets and are able to handle the claims themselves. But when you get down into the foster care industry and almost uh, services for about 900,000 children, including blind and deaf children, those with intellectual and developmental disabilities, those who are homeless, and others, the institutions that they rely on for care will be put under financial strain so great that it's an existential crisis to the entire foster care industry, which means we could lose the entire industry. So the smart move is to follow the lead of Assemblywoman Jen Lunsford, my colleague, who has a bill to create a fund, put that in the budget, even if it's a dry appropriation, you just put the language in the budget without money yet, so you are prepared when these claims come in that you're not having the ancillary and terrible consequence of cutting services for almost a million New York kids. About six years ago now, the Senate Republicans, while they were in the majority, proposed a child victims fund using money from the Manhattan uh, DA's asset forfeiture fund. Do you have any sense or preference of where state revenue should come from to fund a child victims fund in the future? So first, it doesn't surprise me that the Senate Republicans were interested in taking money from the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. That uh, uh, tension uh, has been going back for decades. Um, would I be open to that? Sure. But there are other ways to fund it. And at this point, I'm not uh, in the position where I'm going to argue for revenue. Mm -hmm. um, I am in the position of we need to be ready to deal with this because this is coming and it does put at risk all of the service we, we provide to the most vulnerable children in our state. And what you don't want to have happen is the consequence of the horrible abuse and rapes and other uh, terrible uh, incidences. What you don't want to have happen is those things result in claims that hurt a million other kids. That's where the state needs to step in and make sure it doesn't happen again. And I will also tell you that this is not the same uh, system that we had 40 years ago. There are background checks. There are redundancies. Um, it's just a different animal. So we need to protect the foster care system as it is today. So if you're going to revisit the Child Victims Act, is there merit to the state potentially creating a fund for New Yorkers who brought cases against uh, individuals who are either financially uh, unable to pay out claims or maybe have uh, since deceased because there's no ability for them to get revenue the same way that someone who's suing an existing institution might, and they could still have similar needs that uh, the people who are suing, say, an institution might have. There's a merit to bringing the claim for the victims so they can be made whole after the horrible tragedies. And I would only argue if the uh, foster care agencies that provide the services to our kids are in jeopardy of not being uh, financially solvent, then yes. But if it's just an average individual on their own, no, I don't think the state should be pay bearing the cost of that. My goal here is to ensure the continued service to all of our almost million kids who are now at risk of losing their uh, primary services. Well, on that note, uh, we've been speaking with Assemblymember Andrew Hevesy. He is a Queens Democrat. Assemblymember, thank you so much for making the time. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. I appreciate it. 
Support for the Capitol Press Room is provided by National Fuel and its shareholders, a utility providing natural gas service to heat homes and businesses across western New York. Information on National Fuel's response to proposals to transition away from natural gas service is available at betterplannobans.com.